Hello, and welcome to our presentation on childhood asthma. My name is Victoria Akinola, and I will be discussing what asthma is, as well as what causes asthma. Asthma can be defined as a chronic inflammatory disease of the airway. Asthma can cause many symptoms, including, but not limited to, shortness of breath, chest tightness, coughing, and wheezing. An asthma attack occurs when a trigger causes the airway to constrict, making it very difficult for the individual to breathe. When someone with asthma has asthma symptoms, it means that the flow of air is obstructed as it passes in and out of the lungs. This happens because because of one or both of the following. Number one, the lining of the airways becomes inflamed and may produce more mucus. Or number two, the muscles that surround the airways become sensitive and start to twitch and tighten, causing the airways to narrow. Asthma may feel different to everyone, depending on the severity of the attack. However, for a general understanding of how asthma feels, take a moment to grab a straw if possible and see how long you can last with your air intake coming through a hole the size of a straw. You'll notice as you're doing this that you may start to feel lightheaded and a bit panicked. You may also notice that as you finally remove the straw, you may begin to cough as well. Obviously, this activity is nowhere close to the intensity of having a real asthma attack, as you can choose when to remove the straw at any given time. But you can understand why this disease is so detrimental. Asthma can affect anyone. It is a chronic condition that needs to be monitored and controlled over a lifetime. Next, I will be discussing some of the causes of asthma. With asthma, there is no known definitive cause. An asthma attack can be caused by a variety of things that are often referred to as triggers. Triggers can be different depending on each individual person. So for example, as someone who had childhood asthma, my trigger was cigarette smoke. A trigger is anything or condition that causes inflammation in the airways, which then leads to asthma symptoms. Typically, there are two types of triggers. The first type being inflammatory and the second type being symptom triggers. Inflammatory, otherwise known as allergic triggers, can include things such as dust, animals, mold, and pollen. Symptom triggers, however, can include things such as smoke, exercise, cold air, chemical fumes, and strong smelling substances like perfume. So for example, My trigger, which was secondhand smoke or any type of smoke, would be considered a symptom trigger. Whereas someone who has an allergy to food and that causes their asthma attack to come on, that would be considered an inflammatory trigger. Hi, I'm Sarah and I'll be talking about the anatomy behind the disorder as well as ways to prevent the disease. So which biological system is affected by asthma? It is the respiratory system. When we breathe, air passes through from the nose, then it goes through the pharynx, also known as the throat. Then it goes through the larynx, which is our voice box, and then it goes down the trachea, which is the windpipe. After that, it goes into the lungs and branches off into the major airways within the lungs called the bronchi. It will then pass through even smaller airways called the bronchioles, and lastly, the air will be delivered to the alveoli, which are the air sacs. And this is also where gas exchange is made and carbon dioxide is then released when we exhale. Here is a picture of a normal airway or an airway of a person without asthma. As you can see, the airway is not blocked, but it is open and relaxed. Therefore, air can move in and out easily. However, in asthma, the airway will become inflamed and it will get red and swollen and mucus will soon fill up the airway, making it difficult to breathe. Here is a picture of what happens to the airway when a person is under an asthma attack. As you can see, the muscles that wrap around the bronchial tubes become tightened and extra mucus is formed within the swollen airway. 
The alveoli is then trapped with air and breathing becomes even more difficult as the airway is restricted and oxygen cannot pass through freely. Here is a short video that shows what happens during an asthma attack. Asthma affects the respiratory system, particularly the smaller airways, such as the bronchi and bronchioles. These airways have an inner lining called the mucosa that's surrounded by a layer of smooth muscle. In people with asthma, the airways are chronically inflamed, which can make them hyper-responsive to certain triggers. Some of the many asthma triggers include tobacco smoke, pollen, dust, fragrances, exercise, cold weather, stress, and even the common cold. When people with asthma are exposed to these triggers, an asthma attack or exacerbation can occur. But how exactly do such everyday factors lead to an asthma attack? If an asthmatic is exposed to a trigger, the smooth rings of muscle that circle the small airways in their lungs contract and become narrow. Simultaneously, the trigger worsens inflammation, causing the mucosal lining to become more swollen and secrete more mucus. Under normal conditions, the body uses this mucus to trap and clear particles, like pollen or dust. But during an asthma attack, it blocks the narrowed airways, making it even harder to breathe. These effects lead to the symptoms of asthma. These symptoms may make a person feel like they're running out of air. Yet counterintuitively, during an asthma attack, the inflammation can make it harder to exhale than inhale. Over time, this leads to an excess of air in the lungs, a phenomenon known as hyperinflation. The trapping of air inside the lungs forces the body to work harder to move air in and out of them. Over time, this can lead to reduced oxygen delivery to the body's organs and tissues. So some ways to prevent asthma are to reduce the presence of triggers or by using inhalers. The two main types of asthma inhalers are reliever inhalers and preventer inhalers. Reliever inhalers are used for emergency relief when someone is having an asthma attack or asthma symptoms. These inhalers usually come in blue packaging and contains beta agonists, which help open and relax the airways, making it easier to breathe again. Preventer inhalers contain corticosteroids, which help to build asthma protection over time. It prevents asthma symptoms from happening by reducing inflammation, sensitivity to react to triggers, and overall stop symptoms when you come into contact with triggers. My name is Katherine Healy, and I am going to be covering the clinical manifestation of asthma, the diagnosis of asthma, and the treatment of asthma. Some physical symptoms that are often associated with asthma are sporadic dry coughing, which often wakes up a child at night, wheezing, which is a whistling noise that occurs when exhaling, chest tightening, and shortness of breath. There are also some non-physical signs of asthma. So if a child is participating less in sports or other physical activity than normal, this can be a sign because asthma is often triggered by exercise, so they might sit out because the asthma is causing them pain. There are multiple ways that asthma can be diagnosed, and often a mixture of these ways is used when diagnosing asthma. One of the ways is family medical history. This is to check if any other family members have asthma or diseases with similar manifestations such as asthma. They also check to see how often the symptoms are occurring in the child, um, and if there's a specific time during the day, a particular season, or a particular place where they are experiencing the symptoms more. Physical exams with a doctor are also commonly used. This is when a, a doctor will listen to a child's breathing and they'll look for any signs that are common with asthma. A main tool that is used to diagnose asthma is the lung function test, also called a pulmonary function test. This test measures how fast a child can exhale and how large their lung volume is. To take a lung function test, a person blows into a machine and records statistics about the breathing. There will now be a short clip of a demonstration of a lung function test to give a visual on how they work. Going to perform pulmonary function test, the first step, the patient puts everything to your mouth, put the clip on your nose and breathe normal. Breathe normal, in and out, in and out. Prepare taking deep breath in and blow it out. Keep blowing. Take a deep breath in. Good, thank you. The actual test is longer than this, where the person taking the test would be asked to breathe in multiple different ways to make sure they get the most accurate results. Some of these ways include breathing very quickly 
or exhaling to their full potential before taking a new breath. People are often tested after exercise because asthma is often triggered by exercise. So when they exercise before, they're able to see how exercise affects asthma. Chest x-rays are not used to diagnose asthma, but when trying to diagnose asthma, chest x-rays can be performed to see if a person has another lung disease that has similar symptoms to asthma. When diagnosing asthma, it can be classified into different severities. This include intermittent or persistent and mild, moderate, or severe. These classifications affect the type and amount of medication required to treat asthma. These classifications are based on the results of the lung function test, and this is a photo of a smaller version of a lung function test that can be administered at home to track asthma. Um, this is also based on how often a child are awoken at night by coughing, if the symptoms interfere with a child's everyday life, and how often quick relief medication is used, which is the most common treatment for asthma that is administered when a person is having an attack and how often a child requires systemic corticosteroids, which are a more long-term treatment option. There is no cure for asthma. The goal is to control the symptoms. Medication is based on the classification of asthma and the minimum medication required to control the symptoms. Quick relief medications are administered using a handheld inhaler or nebulizer. These are short-acting beta agonists, and these are medications that are used when a person starts to first notice the signs of an asthma attack happening and they, quick, and they use them to quickly relax tight muscles around your airways and allow the airways to open up so a person is able to breathe normally again. Long-term medications are used daily to control symptoms. Many people with asthma take some kind of long-term medication to help control their asthma. Inhale corticosteroids are the preferred medicine for long-term control of asthma. They're the most effective medication for long-term treatment of inflammation and swelling they are typically safe when prescribed by a doctor, but can have some side effects, including a mouth infection called thrush, which can be combated by having a device called a spacer attached to the inhaler to prevent medication from touching the back of the throat. Long-acting beta agonists are another form of long-term medications used to control symptoms. These are medications that work to open up the airway and might be added to inhale corticosteroids to improve asthma control. These long-acting beta agonists should not be taken by themselves and only as an aid to the corticosteroids. Some other less common forms of long-term asthma medications are inhaled through a nebulizer or injected once or twice a month. It is very important when having an asthma attack that the medication is taken properly to ensure that the asthma attack does not get to a level that is very serious and can harm you. This is a video of a doctor who explains exactly how an inhaler should be used as well as a spacer. Using your inhaler properly can be the difference between asthma control or not. Let me show you how. Shake it up, blow out comfortably, put it to your mouth, push and breathe in long and slow. You've got it down in your lungs, you paid for it, hold it down there for 10 seconds, it will work better. You breathe it in slow and deep so that it won't become turbulent. The faster you breathe it in, it becomes turbulent, deposits in the upper airway. We want it to go way down in the bottom of the lungs. Be sure you're using your inhaler properly. If you can't, there are spacers. This is marvelous. You wet it, slide it in, if I breathe in too fast, it makes a horn blow. So we shake it up, blow out, put our mouth over it, push and breathe in long and slow. That way you'll get all of your medicine down in the lungs. Use your inhaler properly, use it with a spacer. You'll find that your asthma is under much better control and you'll live a happier and healthier life. Give it a try. Another way to control asthma is to avoid conditions that trigger asthma attacks, which helps to reduce the possibility of an asthma attack. One trigger that should not be avoided is exercise, which is extremely important for a healthy lifestyle. Exercise should be done with caution and a person should always have their inhaler on hand when participating in physical activity and be aware of the early signs of a possible asthma attack to ensure that they can treat the asthma and prevent severe attacks. There are some serious complications that can arise from untreated asthma, and this happens because of hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is when there is too much air in the lungs and a person keeps on breathing more and more air into the lungs because they feel a lack of air. 
and this reduced airway space is not letting the air out, so it gets trapped in the lungs. If not treated quick enough, it can lead to a lack of oxygen reaching the tissues and organs in the body and it can damage them, and it can even lead to death. This is an x-ray of lungs that are hyperinflamed, and as you can see, the lung is bulging because it's unable to release any air. Organ and tissue damage and death can occur from serious asthma attack in a person that has undiagnosed and untreated asthma because they are not aware that they need to be treating it, and it could happen out of nowhere, which is why it's important that anyone who has any symptoms or signs of possible asthma should get it checked out. And they can also occur in a person who has asthma and is diagnosed with it but is not able to administer their medication in time, which is why it is extremely important for anybody with asthma to bring their medications with them at all times. My name is Teresa Gomez-Lapore and I will be discussing how asthma relates to the field of ECE. It is very important for people involved in the field of ECE to be well informed and familiarized with asthma, such as what it is, what triggers it, potential symptoms and or side effects, and how to treat it. Unfortunately, asthma can be life-threatening which is why education on the matter is absolutely essential in order to prevent problems associated with asthma in a school setting. A child with asthma in an ECE setting can impact their academic achievement, which can then lead to an influence on the way they function on a daily basis, their self-esteem, emotional status, and finally, their social development. In regards to managing asthma at school, the lack of knowledge on the subject is what results in many problems associated with asthma itself. It is the reasoning behind why many children struggle from its side effects. Since it is very common in children, it is important ECEs stay informed and prepared to treat any child who suffers from it. Being either uninformed or overly focused on a child's condition are both disadvantageous. When someone is uneducated about asthma, it impairs the medical attention one should receive. Being overly concerned or fixated on the subject can in fact have serious psychosocial consequences for the child. An article titled Understanding Children with Asthma states that the key to healthy adaption of the school to the child's asthma is knowledge regard to the illness and a balance between overprotection and neglect. Flexible contingency plans in the event of an asthma attack are important. The most important information schools should be informed about is the general background information regarding asthma and the meaning of the illness itself, so ECEs are aware of what activities the child can and cannot participate in. A few ways to get the message across to all ECEs is through a joint meeting and or conference call between an asthma healthcare provider, the family, and the school. Although children with asthma may be insecure or cause discomfort for teachers and or their peers, it is important ECEs make the child feel welcome and comforted in any situation. They should reassure the child that they are valued and cared for and are just as worthy as children without their condition. If a child feels unwelcomed, especially in a school environment, it may lead to rejection or isolation, which is harmful for a child's growth. In conclusion, people working in an ECE setting should definitely be educated and informed on the concept of asthma, as it can potentially save a life. Thank you for listening to our presentation. I hope you learned a lot about asthma.